When we look at Tesla, what do you take with the price cuts? Some people think that it's a huge advantage and they're cutting prices while giving more value to customers. When you look at other people, they're like, they can't move cars. And so the best way to drum up demand is to cut prices. Which one do you think it is? It's number two. It's number two, hundred percent. Okay. Now I just drove to work and um, I saw a Mercedes EQS, the new Mercedes EQS, and it's sweet. I'm sorry. It's a nice car. You got to compete with it now. Okay. My business partner just bought the BMW i7 electric. It's a beautiful car, massive, just as, but the inside is great. My business partner, my other one just drove in with his new Rivian RTS, beautiful SUV, wonderful car. Okay. People driving the, what is the, uh, the Ionic or something? Five, the Hyundai. I see the ID4s. I see uh, Polestars. I see, um, Trucks, uh, the Rivian trucks, the Ford Mach E's. This was not the case two years ago. You know, like when Tesla was at a high two years ago, 400 bucks trading 100 times earnings. Okay. There was nobody like this. And remember, Tesla could only make a million cars a year. Now they rapidly increase production. Now they're 2 million cars a year, but same with everybody else. So the CEO of the company figures how, what's the best way to sell cars? Piss off all my customers. Okay. Like just piss them off. Now, one great way to do it is have them buy a car, let's say last year for $75,000 that they can now buy today for $45,000. Okay. Well, what do you think the customer says when that happens? They're like super pissed. So you have like two years, the majority of Tesla buyers have gotten screwed essentially where they paid a certain amount for a car, not knowing that it, they would rapidly decrease the prices within a year. Okay. And it's like a free fall in prices. You know, like the, I have a model X plaid that I bought for like, I don't know, 135, uh, two years ago. And today I can sell for 82,000, but a year and a half ago, I could have made money on my car. Teslas were growing in value because the supply and demand were opposite. It was like huge amount of demand, not enough supply of cars. So how do you increase demand when you have an an increasing supply, you have increasing competition, right? So the first thing you do is you advertise. This is what I've been saying for now seven months. Now, Tesla's idea of advertising is they have upgraded the referral program. They've done all kinds of cool ways in the past. You know, I just saw them have a booth at the Malibu Chili Cook-Off and it's out in the corner and they got a booth and two guys standing there. I go, that's not advertising. So football season starts next weekend, this weekend. Okay. How excited are you, Pomp? Because I'm excited. Okay. I think every man in America almost looks forward to this weekend, right? Like I'm in MGM stock. I couldn't be happier. Sports books are open. Vegas is going to be back. The stadiums will be filled with fans. Like where's Tesla advertising? So all you have to do is ask somebody who doesn't own a Tesla what they know about electric vehicles and you'll quickly learn they know nothing. They don't know any of the advantages. Like it costs six times less to operate the vehicle than a gas car. Just, just that alone, okay? Most people have no idea. Most people think that, oh, it's a real big pain to charge, okay? It's not, you know? It takes 10 minutes now, you know, 15 minutes to charge in a supercharger. It used to take 30 or 40 minutes. Not at all. People don't know. So here they could be taking football ads. It would cost them 20 million, 25 million. That's a drop in the bucket for Tesla doing 100 billion in revenue, right? And educate the public, which is a bunch of NBA and Super Bowl ads. They've got all these great creators, make all these great videos that get everybody pumped. And if they ran these ads, I think people would go nuts. Like it would be, wow, you mean I could buy a Model Y for 45K and get a bunch of tax credits to get this thing down to $30,000? People don't know. I can sell Teslas all day long, okay? All day long, but they don't so, do this. They don't do this. So, so they lower point, the price. Lower at the one price. point, I saw you talking about uh, potentially joining the board of directors of Tesla. Is that right. the big thing that you would be focused on is the marketing or are there other things that you think are important for the business? Well, back then I was trying to force the board. Well, it turned out I was right. The board was all paid hundreds of millions of dollars by Elon not to say anything which now in a lawsuit they have lost. And the board of directors of Tesla will be returning $730 million in compensation to shareholders that they were um, paid 
which I guess you could say not illegally, but uh, not correctly. And they're returning money. I mean, like it's a crazy amount of money for five or six people to have to return 700 million, right? Wait, so the explain, board, r- explain this a little bit more because I don't think most people understand this is happening. So what okay, happened so, and then what, what are they having to do? So what happened was last year when Tesla, when Elon decided by Twitter, Tesla's board did not protect Tesla shareholders at all. The stock fell 60 to 70%. It was very detrimental to many people. Uh, it was very costly to people like me as well. Um, you know, I was probably down, you know, 50, 60 million on the position. Not this profits that we lost, but like still, it's like, what are you doing? And then he, Elon was selling stock in the open market throughout the year and often at inopportune times. So you had this 20 or $30 billion of stock sales on top of, you know, he's buying another company and the board did really nothing to protect Tesla shareholders during this period of time. So I finally got pissed when the stock hit hundred and this guy from Singapore calls me uh, Kogan Leo. And he's one of the biggest individual shareholders in Tesla. And he's like, Elon, this is not good. Somebody needs to rein in this guy. I love him, but you know, it's like, he's killing us, you know? And, and I said, well, maybe I'll run for the board, but you have to support me because I can't win anything without some real votes. And he's like, 100%. So I had a good chunk of stock that was going to vote for me. And then it turned out that most of the institutional shareholders are very unhappy with the board as well. And, and, and it turned out I probably could have won. So that's, that's when I got scared, you know, because at first I was just an activist. And then I really realized I had a tremendous amount of support. Um but then when I looked into it, I was like, dude, this is like diving into World War One, you know, and part of it was the fact that the board was each paid 200 million each by Elon. And I had never seen that in a board in my life. And I didn't know that until I started looking into this. And then I was like, how the hell is Robin Delholm worth $300 million or something when she worked at Telestra in Australia? Like, there's no way. And then I looked, it was all options from Tesla. And I go, how is this possible? Board members make like 400K a year, you know, like at most companies. And that's like reasonable. That's more than reasonable, you know, for a couple of meetings a year and whatever. So how do you get from 400K a year to like 200 million, right? You know, so I knew something was off. And how much of that was options that were given at a really low price, the stock price explodes and that accounts for a, a huge part of it versus they're literally getting, you know, two hundred million dollars at a high stock price, and and it's almost like I'm issuing this person two hundred million dollars. Right. It, it, it's a combination of both. So he didn't issue people two hundred million, but many of them had only been on the board for two or three years. So it was like they were kind of given this gift. So they got a huge amount of stock options that was way more. Like a board member should not get a million dollars in stock options or, or five billion dollars in shop, stock options. It's just it's like absurd, you know. And and clearly shareholders weren't really privy to this. And and so there was a lawsuit and the lawsuit was just settled by the board of directors of Tesla for 730 million. And basically each individual board member has to give back like 200 million. It's crazy. Okay. I've never seen this in my life. And I go, no. And, and so when I started pushing for things like advertising, transparency, secession planning, you know, some sort of like normalcy at a, you know, $700 billion company, um, you know, the Tesla started adjusting to those things. So when I talked to Tesla, they were like, we want to do all these things, but it's Elon, you know? And I was like, so they're basically like, yeah, go ahead, Ross. You can go try to convince him because we'll all get fired, you know? So if you go to Elon and you say, this isn't a good idea, he'll fire you. So nobody's going to go do that at Tesla. So they're like all for it. So after much negotiation, they they ended up doing investor day, which I flew out for. And they, and they did all this like song and dance. Here are all the executives. And then they fire Zach who they present as the, you know, the next guy, you know, so Elon gets rid of, gets Linda Yaccarino and comes back to Tesla and the guy they anoint as the number two of Tesla, Zach, they fire or whatever happens to him. Right. And I'm not, it's just like, what's next, dude. You know, the whole purpose of secession plan was to build Drew and Zach and all these other leaders, Tom Shu. And the minute he gets back, he fires the best guy. And they can say, oh, he didn't fire him. It's like, well, why would he quit? You know? How long had he been there? 13 years. He was like the guy. You know, this guy was maybe you think maybe he was just tired. He just wanted to retire. Go home. He's 30 years old. 
He's 30. You tired? He's, he started working at 17? No, he started like out of college. So maybe he's 35. I mean, look, he's yeah, a kid. Yeah. He's a fucking kid, Bob. Are you tired? How old are you? I'm 52. Yeah. I'm not tired. You give me 500 million, I, I'll get up early. You know what I mean? Come on. <laughs> tired. What, what, he doesn't even have a family to spend time with, you know? But one little known fact was he is gay. And so, you know, there's all kinds of things that go on that we don't see, but he lost a key guy. I don't care what you want to say. You can spin it. You can say this or that. He lost a key guy who's really good, really good. You know, I, I'm I'm like, I'm sure he's going to show up at Google or some somewhere pretty soon. But but nevertheless, I I feel like the board. Even to this day, you know, pretty much lets Elon do what he's going to do. And, and that's that. Look at the SpaceX article today. SpaceX gave Elon a billion dollars to tie him over during the, the Twitter nightmare, you know, so he could sell more Tesla stock and then pay back SpaceX. That's basically what happened. So he could, he didn't even have enough cash to buy Twitter. So when when the deal actually went through, he's like borrowing money and all this kind of stuff. So it's front page of the Wall Street Journal today. He's like just using SpaceX as his piggy bank, basically. Now I'm going, this is like a massive $150 billion space company. And the CEO can just borrow a billion bucks for the month so he can do something else. It's only only a Tesla or SpaceX or whatever. So so in SpaceX case, it's a private company, so they can do what they want. But in Tesla's company, it's a public company, and you can't do these things. And that's why there's so many lawsuits and SEC investigations and nonsense that goes on around Tesla. Tesla has the glass house investigation? Yeah, the glass house. What, what's going on with that? That's nonsense. Nonsense. I mean, first of all, Elon's crazy, so he might do stuff that – but he doesn't care about himself at all. Like, like – He's the most non self wealth interested person who's wealthy that I know. Like I hang out with some of these billionaire people and you go over to their like mini hotels because they're not houses anymore. You're you're if you have a big house, you're not that wealthy anymore. You have to have a mini hotel. Okay. So that's what they do here in California is the billionaires build these mini hotels that they live in. It's like going to the four seasons. OK, so like you show up at their house and they've got like the staff and the whole bit and they take your car and then they offer you hors d'oeuvres and treat. it is the four seasons. That's how these people live. Elon sleeps on a couch like at the factory. He's sleeping. At, he got in trouble at Twitter because he put a bunch of beds upstairs in the offices. It's like, we'll all sleep here, you know, and like he's legendary for this. He has like massive back problems because he doesn't sleep on a regular bed half the time. like. He's perfectly happy sleeping in a car kind of guy. So the idea that he's somehow absconding with like resources of Tesla to build some glass house, you know, SEC is getting a little bit desperate in their investigations. That's what I think. But one thing I'm sure of is that he is 100% focused on his goals, whether it be Mars or Tesla or Neuralink or AI now. And like personal wealth stuff is not him, you know. If he was he used to, start to have a, houses and stuff, but he sold them all, you know. If Elon started another company tomorrow and he called you up and he said, "Hey, I want you to invest," would you do it? Probably, yeah. yeah. All right. What would cause you, you know, to sell? What would cause you to sell the Tesla position? Well, right now, you know, I'm a long term investor, so my firm and my basic wealth belief system is you own these great companies that produce tons of cash and take care of their shareholders. And you just hold those forever. 